Classifying audio is an incredibly useful application of machine learning. We can essentially create a machine that interprets sounds much in the same way we humans interpret sounds. But it can do more than that too, as we can create microphones that go beyond human hearing. For now, let's focus on things we can hear. One of the most fascinating pieces of embedded machine learning is the home smart speaker. This is the Amazon Echo. Internally, a microcontroller is listening for the keyword. When it hears that keyword, it begins streaming any audio after that to Amazon servers, where much more complicated machine learning algorithms can perform natural language processing to figure out what you're trying to ask of it. The interesting thing is that on the device itself, only a relatively simple keyword spotting system is running, looking for that one word. By now, you're probably familiar with that keyword. Alexa, who is Jeffrey Hinton? According to Wikipedia, Jeffrey Everest Hinton CCFRS FRSC is a British Canadian cognitive psychologist and computer scientist, most noted for his work on artificial neural networks. Since 2013, he divides his time working for Google and the University of Toronto. In 2017, he co-founded and became the chief scientific advisor of the Vector Institute in Toronto. The combination of embedded machine learning and large server-based machine learning is what makes these smart speakers work. Speech is considered a new frontier in the world of computer interfaces, but audio classification is not just restricted to speech. For example, we could create a system that identifies various calls of different animals. The open collar is an open source wildlife tracking collar used by researchers and conservationists. Haxter, in partnership with Edge Impulse and others, ran a contest to develop the next elephant tracking collar. As Africa's elephant population is declining, researchers are looking for improved ways to track them, and including machine learning on embedded collars is one way to do that. This can help create stronger legislation and law enforcement to prevent poaching and abuse. Security systems are also being created to detect sounds like glass breaking to help protect homes and businesses. The sound of breaking glass has such a unique signature that we can easily apply machine learning to recognize it. Be aware that any sort of recording device may carry legal and privacy implications. In the past few years, courts in the United States have ordered Amazon to turn over Echo devices or release recorded voice data stored on their servers as evidence during an investigation. Even if you promise not to sell or release a user's recordings, how will you respond when there's a search warrant involved? Let's talk about how audio recording works. A microphone is a sensor that converts sound waves into an electrical signal. There are two types of microphones, dynamic and condenser mics. In a dynamic microphone, the moving air strikes a diaphragm, which moves a coil of wires over a permanent magnet to generate an electrical current. This is the opposite of how a speaker works. In a condenser microphone, the moving diaphragm changes the distance between the plates of a capacitor, causing a change in the electrical field, which produces a changing electrical signal. The voltage of these electrical signals can be sampled at periodic intervals to create a digital audio recording. At rest, we would expect to see zero volts or some kind of DC bias. This bias can easily be adjusted with a hardware filter or in software to make the waveform appear to be zero volts when there's no sound. As the coil or capacitor moves in one direction, the voltage would be positive, and as it moves in another direction, the voltage would be negative. As a result, we can usually expect audio signals to result in some kind of alternating current. For example, this is a visualization of the voltage changes as I spoke the word hello into a microphone. Let's say we zoom in on a piece of that waveform. We have our microcontroller sample the voltage every 62.5 microseconds. We take the reciprocal of the sampling period to get the sampling rate, which is 16 kilohertz in this case. Something to keep in mind is that you must keep the sampling rate the same between your training data set and your deployment device. For example, let's say we want to deploy to our Arduino board, which only has a sampling rate of 16 kilohertz. However, we want to collect data with our smartphone or other device. Here, the recordings happen at 44.1 kilohertz. You would need to downsample your training, validation, and test sets to 16 kilohertz prior to feature extraction so that it lined up with our target inference device. Don't worry, Edge Impulse will take care of downsampling audio files for us to the appropriate 16 kilohertz.
Next, let's talk about bit depth. When you sample a voltage with a digital system, that sample needs to be saved as a number somewhere in memory. To really save on memory, let's say we record these samples as 4-bit numbers. Even though the original waveform is a continuous analog signal, we'd have to quantize these values. That means each sample is rounded up or down to fit into one of the 16 numbers allowed by a 4-bit number. These numbers are just stored as an array or list in memory, but if we were to plot them, they'd look something like this. Notice that without some advanced techniques like interpolation, each sample is held at its value for the entire sampling period, creating this step-like function for the waveform. While the sampling rate stays the same, you can see that the waveform is a little off because we had to round each sample to fit into one of those 16 levels. 16 levels is not a lot to work with when trying to reconstruct complex audio signals. If we were to play our 4-bit sample through a speaker, it would probably sound awful, and you'd have a hard time hearing the word hello. We usually don't want to work with anything less than 8 bits of quantization in audio. In fact, our digital microphone on the Arduino is capable of 16-bit quantization. You can also find 32-bit quantization or floating point values to get even more precision. However, 16 bits is what we have to work with for this project. You can see that less rounding has occurred for each sample, so it's closer to matching the original waveform. Once again, you'll want to have the bit depth of your training data match the bit depth of your microphone on your deployment system. It's easier to drop precision to go from, say, 32 bits to 16 bits than it is to increase precision. So we can capture audio on a device like a high-end microphone to create our training set, downsample, and reduce precision for training, and then ultimately deploy on a microphone with less precision. I normally recommend collecting data with the same device, or one just like it, as the device you're ultimately planning to deploy your model to. Sensors, including microphones, can have a wide range of variations in their ability to detect lower and higher frequencies, as well as pick up noise. As a result, the waveform from the same sound may look slightly different between two different microphones. By keeping the data collection and deployment devices the same, you can control these variations. However, I've found that for keyword spotting with the particular features we will use, it won't ultimately matter. Feel free to collect data with just about any recording device, like your smartphone or laptop microphone, train, and then deploy to the Arduino. If you don't have an Arduino board, I'll show you a demo using a smartphone.